Hi everyone. Today we wanted to talk about something that's a little bit of a taboo in the specialty coffee world, and that's decaffeinated coffee. We wanted to talk about what decaffeination is, how we go about sourcing and roasting our decaf coffees, why we even stock them, and hopefully you'll leave with a little bit of an understanding about how that process actually works and why the coffee can be really delicious when it's decaffeinated. So firstly, we need to look briefly at what caffeine is. So it's a bitter psychoactive compound that exists naturally within coffee, and it's there as an insecticide, so a deterrent to prevent bugs and pests from nibbling the coffee cherries and the leaves, as it's toxic to them. So when you prepare a cup of coffee, you're gonna have varying amounts of caffeine in your cup, depending on the origin of the coffee, the variety at play, how much you actually used to brew your cup and the quality of your extraction. So it could be anything from 70 to 150 milligrams in your morning cup of coffee. If you wanna learn a little bit more about caffeine in detail, we'll pop a link to a coffee chemistry website below where you can learn a bit more, read a bit more, and there's a video there you can watch as well. So other than artificially decaffeinated coffees, there are species and varieties of coffee that are naturally very, very low in caffeine. You have eugenoides, which is a species of coffee that actually parented Arabica along with Robusta, which is very low in caffeine. And also a variety of Arabic called Larina or Bourbon Pointu, which is also very, very low in caffeine. Now these aren't widely planted, they're not very commercially available, but they're really interesting to try if you find a roaster stocking them. So I'd, I'd encourage you to give them a taste. Now, some coffee roasters will issue stocking a decaf coffee entirely. That's completely up to them. But for us, it's nice to be able to include people who want to drink coffee, but have to limit or completely eliminate caffeine from their diet whether that's on a permanent or temporary basis. And we feel like we can still offer a really great product to them. We've seen a lot of people actually becoming what we'd call dual drinkers. So they're having caffeinated coffee at some times in the day and decaf coffee at other times in the day. They're not exclusively belonging to one camp or the other. Drinking coffee is such a social act that we feel like it can be exclusionary not to cater for people who have higher sensitivities to caffeine. If they want to drink a cup of coffee for its delicious flavor and other remedial benefits, we're really happy to be able to offer a couple of different options to those people. So there are several ways you can decaffeinate green coffee. The first being Swiss water method. There's also supercritical CO2. There's methylene chloride. But the one that we want to focus on today and talk about because it's our preferred method is sugarcane derived ethyl acetate decaffeination. So what is ethyl acetate? I think we need to cover that a little bit to understand how the processing is going to work. Now it's a compound that comes around naturally in fruits and vegetables like apples and pears and bananas. And in young wines, it's often that like young fruity wine aroma. It's an ester with a kind of pear droppy smell to it. And because it's naturally occurring, you can market EA decaffeinated coffees as naturally decaffeinated in the way you can with Swiss water or CO2 methods. But you can't do that with things like methylene chloride where it's a synthesized solvent at work doing the decaffeination. For the last six years, we've worked exclusively with sugarcane ethyl acetate decaffeinated coffees from Colombia. And these have been secured through several exporters, um, Aluna Beans, Azahar, but primarily through Caravella Coffee. Now, they've been processed at the Descafecol plant in Colombia, which is the only decaffeination plant in the country. And there are several reasons why we think this is the best method to use. The main one being the coffee doesn't need to ship twice. The coffee's grown in Colombia, taken to the plant, and then it ships to us here in the UK. That means it doesn't have to be shipped first to Germany or Switzerland or wherever it might be, and then shipped again and limiting the time that seeds have to spend in a container arriving to us here in the UK is going to be better for the seeds themselves, they'll degrade less, it's less costly, and also there's less of an ecological footprint for moving the coffee. We've also found that the flavour imprint from decaffeination with the EA method is least detectable compared to Swiss water and CO2 methods, and at times experienced cuppers and tasters haven't even clocked that a coffee is decaffeinated when they taste some of the EA coffees that we've had on the table. So I asked some questions to Alejandro Cadina of Caravella Coffee about their experience of working with Descafecol, who they've worked with for a long time, and these are some of his answers. Caravella started decaffeinating at the Descafecol plant in 2008, being the first specialty exporter in Colombia to use fresh, high-quality coffee at that plant. Before them, almost all the coffee they decaffeinated was old crop coffees or inferior grades. And when they processed their first lot, they couldn't believe how green the final product looked. All the coffees generally turned out more black colored than green and the difference in color could be explained by the sort of density or porosity of the beans and we asked are there any benefits to ea decaffeination over water or co2 methods and he said this before doing ethyl acetate at discafecol they used swiss water method that was considered the best at the time 
When they started using Descafecol, the results in the cup quality were far superior, not only for them, but also for their customers. They stopped using Swiss water entirely and the cost was lower, they guaranteed a fresher product, the carbon footprint was lower, and the value added generated at origin was higher. So they had complete control over the process and they made sure that the quality of the coffee going in was maintained in the coffee coming out. So it feels like there's a lot of benefits for them to be working in Colombia. So let's look at how the decaffeination process actually works. The first step is to earmark a lot of coffee to be decaffeinated. And we'll go a little bit more into detail on how those lots are put together later. So the coffee is delivered to the decaffeination plant, Descafecol, and that's located in Manizales, kind of between Medellin and Bogota in Colombia. The first step in the process is that the green coffee is steamed to swell up a little bit, and that helps to remove the silver skin layer. The silver skin is kind of a very fine papery layer that clings to the green seeds within the parchment layer, which first of all have been milled off. The beans are then moistened with hot water, so they begin to swell, and we start to see the beginning of hydrolysis of caffeine. The caffeine starts to loosen its bond with the salts of chlorogenic acids in the coffee. Now, chlorogenic acids are a sort of group of polyphenolic antioxidant compounds within the coffee, and they aren't reduced in the decaffeination process. Once that's taken place, mountain spring water is mixed with the ethyl acetate, which is gonna be our active solvent here, and that's produced from fermenting sugarcane. That mixture circulates around the beans, bathing them continually until 99.9% .9 of the caffeine has been targeted and dissolved away with the ethyl acetate. Now that the ethyl acetate solvent has done its work of decaffeinating the green beans, the next stage is to remove that, remove any traces of that, which is done with a low pressure steam passing through the coffee. The coffee then needs to be dried down again. So this is done by placing them into large drums uh, in a vacuum, and they'll be dried down to between 10 and 12% moisture which is much more stable for them to ship again. The coffee is cooled down using fans to a nice temperature, and then it's actually protected with carnauba wax. It's like a vegetable wax, which kind of seals them again because the process is quite invasive. So this is just a sort of protective layer to again aid them in their shipping to us. So now the caffeine has been taken out of the coffee, that can be sold on. It's sold on to pharmaceutical companies or soft drink manufacturers, and you can buy bags of it from Descafecol themselves. So which lots do we actually have decaffeinated for us to roast here in London? With Caravella Coffee, they have various community coffees within Colombia, one such being La Serenia, which is uh, the product of 38 families work in Pitalito Huila. And what you need to do is collate enough to put 62 bags in for decaffeination. From the decaffeination process, you only get 58 to 60 bags out because of the loss of weight of the caffeine itself from the coffee. For us, 60 bags uh, of an exclusive decaf coffee would be a little bit too much. We wouldn't get through that volume before the lot had degraded. So we're relying on Caravella to earmark the right lots, have them decaffeinated and take a portion of that for our own roasting. So when it comes to roasting the decaf coffees that we've bought, firstly, they look a little bit strange. They're a bit darker in hue and some of the physical analysis we do gives you strange numbers compared to the regular washed lots we have. If you were roasting just based on visual cues or auditory cues, you might struggle to get a really nice roast with the decaf coffee if you're only used to doing regular coffees. But because we're using multiple temperature probes, pressure gauges, roasting software, we can get a really, really nice roast profile set up for both an espresso and a filter roast of our decafs. One thing that's been perpetuated in the coffee industry is that it's really hard to roast decaffeinated coffees. But actually I find our decaf coffees really easy to roast. They're highly uniform, they've got good density, and they come out with a really, really nice balanced, clean flavor. And I think if you're using older crops or poorer grades to be decaffeinated and then roast, that's really the reason why they're tricky to roast because it's very hard to roast poorer grade coffees. So the relationship between a lot being decaffeinated and a lot being hard to roast is probably correlative and not causal. Historically, we just offered one roast profile of our decaf coffees and that was as espresso. The idea being most of the people drinking decaf coffees are having a latte or a cappuccino or something where you're really getting that coffee experience because of the look of the drink, the texture of the milk, the creaminess. And what we found was a lot of people actually wanted to buy a 250 gram bag of the espresso roast beans and brew them in their V60 or their AeroPress. They wanted to have a really nice, balanced, clean, flavorful filter coffee with the decaf beans. What we had to do was sort of alter our brewing advice for getting the most delicious results with an espresso roast. But actually we said, well, why don't we just do a filter roast as well? So now we have something that gives you a really clean, balanced, crisp cup with our filter roast if you're brewing it in your V60 or AeroPress. And then we also have the espresso roast if you're making espresso or milk drinks. That's all for today's look at sugarcane decaffeination. 
I really hope you learned something from today's video and it might invite some more questions. So if there's anything you think I missed or you want to ask further questions, let us know in the comments below or you can email us on betterbrewing at workshopcoffee.com. I'd encourage you to try the decaf options we have because I personally think they're really delicious. And um, that's it from us for today. So take care and we'll see you soon.